Because you could use your phone to do that. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to start with something a little bit different today. It'll, hopefully it'll make sense in a moment. If you could just like raise one of your hands and like move it around. Just, okay, good. <laughs> what just happened there is something that from a philosophical and psychological standpoint is very difficult to explain. Because what happened, I had an idea in my mind. And I was able to, you know, make some vibrations in the air and take that idea from my mind and put it into your mind and then elicit a response from you. So, and everybody speaks differently at different pace, so those vibrations aren't always the same. And yet your brain, your mind was able to hear that, translate it into the concept that I had in my mind, and I was able to take a piece of my mind and put it into your mind so that we shared that thought. And then you were able to translate that into some kind of response or some kind of action. Um, that's, I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but that's very deep. And I want to show you how that connects to anything that we might be possibly talking about in here. So if you would this morning, as always, we'll start with a devotion from God's Word. If you would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, is explaining to them that when he came to them, uh, he wasn't using fancy rhetoric or anything like that. All he was focused on was Jesus Christ and Him crucified. All he was focused on was communicating clearly to them the message of the Gospel. And he explains that this message doesn't come from the world. And uh, that it is in fact God who has given this truth an explanation of what happened. So we had the event, and then God is explaining. And then in verse 10, he, he picks up where I want to pick up this morning. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So a couple of things that I wanted to point out this morning, because doing Bible study methodically requires some work. And, you, and so every week I want to remind you why it is we're doing, why this is such a blessing and a privilege to be able to do this. The first thing we notice is this reinforcement of the idea that the Spirit and the Word work together. Right? So I mentioned in the introduction, people, everybody wants to have this spiritual experience. But where the Spirit is active, the Word is active. And where the Word is active, the Spirit is active. The two in the scripture are very closely bound together. So we see here that uh, the Spirit has taught them what? And what, what does Paul say when talking about what he's received from the Spirit here? Well, at least one thing he's received are words. Did you notice that? Verse 13, and we impart this in words. So this isn't some nebulous kind of thing that we can't have access to, but it's, it's the words that the apostles have received in our teaching. It's the teaching of the gospel. It's the word of God. And so in the same way I was able to take this idea from my mind and transfer it to your mind and re elicit an, act, an action or a reaction, this is part of what Paul's saying the teaching is in the word of God. It's the truth that the Spirit then uses to transform your mind. So I meet so many people who they want to be closer to God. And 
it's almost like when if you give people an answer that's too simple, they won't they won't accept it. They've got to find something more work, more complicated. If you want to be closer to God, if you want, if there's there's no way to be more intimately connected to somebody than to be able to share their thoughts. My wife can pretty much finish my sentences and tell me what you know what I was going to say because she she knows me so well. You want to know God that way? Spend time in His Word. We have the mind of Christ. We have the thoughts of God. So we see the events of God working in history, and we have His interpretation of what those events mean and what those events are supposed to accomplish. And so this truth that we have is a window into the very mind of God. So why would we slow down? Why would we go through all of these processes to try to understand the Word of God as best we can? Because it's that truth that the Spirit is using to transform our minds and make us more like Christ. And uh, we see a little glimpse of that here in what Paul's sharing with the Corinthians. He's giving them what the Spirit gave him, what the Spirit revealed to him, in these words. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you so much for sending your Son to to live the life that we failed to live, to die the death that we deserve to die, and to be raised again unto glory that you freely give us through our union with him in faith. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you for your love, which put this plan together to save us, who had nothing in us to uh, warrant you to respond to us in that way of love. We thank you for your spirit, Lord, the one who comforts us, who convicts us of sin, Lord, and who works with your word to, to cut down into the very marrow of our soul, separating truth from falsehood, convicting us of sin, making us aware of where we fall short and giving us comfort and bringing us to you in dependence on the gospel for our salvation. We thank you for your word, Lord, to instruct us and to strengthen us like food for our spirits, Lord. And we pray this morning as we continue in our study that you would be with us, that you would give us insight, and that you would help us to, to see you in what we read and to grow in our knowledge of the mind of Christ. We ask all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. So you had a couple of, couple of weeks to dig into this a little bit. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you're able to get pick up a few things. So the last thing I think that I had asked you to do was to see what you could find out about who wrote this. So we know Jude wrote it. What did you learn about Jude? Is there anything that you're able to find. Let's first start just in this letter. So in this letter, what did you learn about Jude? Calls himself a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. That's how he chose to identify who he was. Right, okay, so at least in this book, uh, he's the brother of James. He's a uh, bond servant of Christ. Okay, what else? No. Yeah. Just in, in more general in more general terms, what do we have to know? What do we know about him by the fact that he wrote this. Well, Good. theologians believe that he was that he was uh, Christ's half brother. Okay. Do we get that from this book yet? Not yet. Yeah. So let's let's get what we get in the book. You're right. Well, I'll come right back to that in a minute because that is important. To say that he was a Jew. Okay. Well, how do you know that from this book? Because constant references to things that only a Jew would be familiar with. Okay. Yep. So he's likely Jewish. We'll put that. Likely. That's true. He does not say. 
Yeah, actually, so we have now several people following along online, and so I'm getting questions via email, which is neat. One of the things somebody said is, last time, weren't we already getting into some interpretation a little bit? But yeah, because you know we're not robots, so when right. you observe something, you're already starting to try to draw conclusions. The, the important thing is, as we do that, to make sure those things are just potentially interpretations, right? So as we see, like like what you just did here, is he Jewish? Probably, but that's tentative. We don't know for sure yet. And so we want to get through all the observation and then see whether our assumptions are are supported by everything, all the evidence. And, and you really want to be sensitive. Is there anything that would tell you that you're wrong? Uh, so that you can dig into it a little bit more. So yeah, it's not as like cut and dried as, as you'd like to make it where like we're robots and we can just but when we come up with a potential interpretation, we just want to make sure it's tentative. We say, hey, this potentially could be true. We're going to make a note of that, and we're going to see whether that holds up. So yeah, so that's a good example of, of that. Yeah, he's a lot of Jewish references here. He's educated. He's educated. How do you know? Because he wrote that. He wrote. He's, <laughs> he's, he's literate because he wrote a letter. That's very. That's important. That's a good observation. I don't know if this actually was, but it's version came after the crucifixion. Uh, yeah, he's writing after uh, after Christ's crucifixion. His so, conversion. Oh, his conversion. Well, that do you get that in this book? Two readings. Huh? For theologian. Yeah, but you don't get it from Jude. Okay. So we'll come back. Well, you got a lot of good information, but it's well, coming from somewhere besides. Yeah. Jude. So let's look at Jude first, right. and then we'll look at what we get from the rest of the book. His name was changed, they believe. His name was changed from Judas to Jude. They, okay, the so where, where in this letter do you see Again, that? It's an understanding question. Thaddeus was his name. So the process is you've got the, the, the letter he wrote, you've got the rest of the scripture, and then you've got other historical information. So right now we're focused just on what we can learn from this letter which is of primary importance because this is what he shares about himself to the people that he's writing, which is usually connected to his purpose in writing. Now, I did talk about our common salvation. So he talked about our common salvation, so he's saved. He's saved. He's a, what, he's a bond servant of Christ, right. so he's, a, he's got a, you know, and then he's talking about common salvation. Yep. And he's not an apostle. He doesn't refer to himself no, as an doesn't. apostle, right? And he even says, but he, doesn't he talks about the apostles saying they yeah. later yep. in the letter. So, so There's he, a reason for that, though. Okay. There's, he, he doesn't identify right. in this letter as an apostle. That doesn't mean he isn't one, but he doesn't say that he's one. So that's interesting. If we find out, so maybe he's not one. He's one of the twelve. Mm, he doesn't say that in okay. here. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. I don't know if I'm going too far or not, but part of what they're saying, if this might be the next question, he, he, there's a tie with the book of Peter, so he's certainly closely associated or it was around the same time. He is, you haven't really asked that question at the time. Yep. Yeah. So, so again, I know this is hard to do if you're not in the habit. If you didn't have anything but this letter, what do you know about Jude? Well, I'm mentioning it from the verse later on. Which one? The one, well, it mentions the verse that, that, that beloved, remember the word which was spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. I should be mockers in the last time. It comes from Peter. So. Right. So I'm just saying there's a tie in there of some sort where... There absolutely um, is, but yes. we, wouldn't know, we don't know yet. We don't know yet what she we can do with that because book. first we just want to look at what's uh, in this letter. I guess it says too soon. No, you guys are, are sharing a lot of good stuff, but it comes from elsewhere in the scripture, which is step two. The, and the, let me explain why that's important. Because when, an, if you remember, what are the three things that work together to, to, to provide meaning? Do you remember? This is important. It'll help you keep all these pieces of the study straight. Observation. Okay, observation is, is the process we go through to identify what's there, but it's not it's not what I'm asking okay. though. So But there were three things. So yeah, I there were three. You're right. You were you were <laughs> that was a really good guess. Not what I was going for though. Okay. okay. Oh, purpose. The purpose. Context. Context. Structure. And structure. 
those did three, not remember those year. three things, those three things work together Perfect. to to provide the meaning in the text. And so when we when we're looking at who is the author right now, we want to start with what he reveals in the piece of literature we're looking at. Why? Because it will go to purpose. So what I, I'm just trying to understand why what I said was and totally content. disconnected from what you're saying. I mean, because right. that's the other next question of when the book was. I mean, so what you're saying is not exactly what you're talking about now. I mean, I'm trying to see. What, what I'm saying is both of you have shared very valuable insight that we will use, but we're just not. You're just ahead of us, and and it's important to me that you do get that discipline of saying first, Perfect. what does he share in this letter? Because I would say he's cons he, he's concerned. He's concerned. Okay, but we're going to. You're right, but we're trying to get to who you know who he is, what his relationship is to okay. these people. He had a knowledge of the warnings for the church. So. Okay, so he's he's knowledgeable about the about scripture and prophecy, right? right? Right. So I think that that would go to literate. We're going to say educated, and then even in the faith, we'll say. He seemed to have some place of authority because right in verse three, he. Jumped in. I found it necessary to write to you, appealing to you to content. So right, there's he's somebody. He has influence. There's implied authority in the fact that he's addressing these people yeah. this way. Mm -hmm. And I'd say a close relationship with the recipients. So one beloved, of the questions, beloved, beloved. Yeah. So one of the questions is, what is his relationship to the people he's writing to? There seems to be a, a close, affectionate type of relationship, right? So there's a, I'm going to call it a brotherly relationship or, or an affectionate relationship. It's an affectionate relationship or a brotherly relationship. They're not, they're, they're not, it's not an adversarial relationship. That's for sure. I guess I'm being very difficult. I'm just trying to see how this is any different than any of the other letters that were written, and any of the points we brought up. Well, it might not. Well, I, I mean, it's somewhat know. different. I not think this one right well, here. Well, that. Okay. Stop right, right, right there. All right. <laughs> so a lot of these are, are the same, but for example, um, affectionate relationship, and when we tie this to purpose, so Paul has an affectionate relationship with the Galatians, but it's not going to connect to the letter in the same way as his affectionate relationship with these guys does, you you begin to see that oh, yeah, as you so expand it. Trying, so, trying to see how we're finding something unique here when it seems like Okay. It's, sorry, I get a bit. What else? Anything else just from Jude? He was familiar with the book of Enoch. He was familiar with the book of Enoch, right? Educated in the faith, and then not to get too fancy, but intertestamental literature. Right. That fits in what I was thinking with what he's saying, because if it, I'm gonna say it, if that's valid and the other but it's still what you're looking for. Yeah, no, but he's he's familiar with other literature. And that's uh, and, and, and so Richard educated in the faith, in the scripture, there's some connection here. We don't know whether Peter depends on him or he depends on Peter, but he's he's right. familiar with uh, other literature besides, you know, he's not writing this in a vacuum as if he's the only. Right. The well, only we, I just wonder, are we in the second ring yet? Or still in the uh, not yet, although that's that's sort of at the end of the ring. <laughs> so, okay. Anything else from Jude itself? So, one of the, one of the reasons, uh, or one of the things I want you to see. So when I originally assigned this, somebody said, well, there's not much there. Well, there actually is quite a bit there if you really slow down and look at it. So now let's see uh, from elsewhere in the scripture some things that, that we can figure out about him. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re re erase some of this because I think we've, we've got it. So from, from elsewhere in the Bible, what do we learn about him? So this is some of the stuff that you guys tried to sneak in on me earlier. <laughs> I found three verses. That okay, what? Uh, let's see. What are they? First Corinthians nine five. First Corinthians nine five, and what does it say? 
Let me pull it out. It says, do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Okay. So what does that tell you about Jude? Well, the that the Lord had brothers. It confirms that the Lord had brothers. It doesn't say he, Jude's one of them. No, it doesn't. But it, we start to see, hey, this, this kind of starts to make sense. Interestingly, though, Jude doesn't refer to himself as a brother of Christ in the letter. No. So that will become important in a moment. So you're, you're on to something, but again, we're, you're too far ahead of us. Okay. You're in the outer ring. It seemed like... <laughs> I, don't the, want I looked at all the introductions, and it seemed like... They readily identified themselves in the first verse as an apostle. Paul did. Um, Peter did. Mm -hmm. John didn't. wasn't into introductions. He just jumped right into the body. But when Paul was writing with somebody else that wasn't an apostle, then he would say something like bond servant, brother. Right. Okay. That that's a good observation. It seems like there are two Judas, the same Greek word that both have verses that call him the brother of James. Yeah. Two different men. There are several men with the same name like in the nine? New Testament, so you have to be careful. Right. Eight, yeah. Okay. Anybody yeah. else have, have a specific reference to, to Jude in the... Well, just... From studying reading, just uh, they believe that, his, uh, theologians believe that because of his conversion after being the brother of Jesus, and then his conversion is not coming to after the crucifixion. That he writes, opens the letter that way and refers to himself as a bondservant instead of a brother. Because of humility. Prove it. I, I, I can't. Well, yeah, I think let yeah. the theologians <laughs> prove it. I, I yeah, but I don't I know, what I can't the theologians prove it, but say. No, we, want, say we want to see. My understanding we want to see. We, I, I understand where you're going, Jack, and I'm not, I'm not trying to give you a right. time. But we, we, we've got to set aside what we think we know or what anybody else yeah. thinks okay. they know. And say, how do they know? But it's possible. But it's, it is possible, yeah. and I think I can show you why they say that. But let's yeah. let's go through the process and let's see okay. if that's if, if that's even definitive, true. I can't. At this point, we don't even know that he's Jesus' brother. We haven't seen that anywhere. Yeah. Well, there's Ma uh, Matthew thirteen fifty. Yeah, Matthew thirteen fifty five <laughs> might help. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph? and Simon and Judas. Right, so in Matthew 13.55, we find out that Jesus has a brother named Judas. Now, we don't know it's this guy, but right. mm -hmm. but he does have a brother named Judas, which is the same name as Judas. Right. It's the same, the same thing. So there's a bro brother of Jesus mentioned by this name. And brother James. And a brother of, because and Jesus also had a that's brother what named Jude James. Told us. Yeah. Brother of James. That's what he looked at. Yep. So, and Jude said he's the brother of James, right? So now we know that there's one other person with this name in the New Testament who has a brother named G, who has a brother Jesus, and who has a brother James. Yeah. Right. So now we're starting to build. Like, how do we know this, or why do we think this? So that's important, and that becomes hugely important when we're trying to think about why he would introduce himself the way he, he does. Um, because if I had, if Jesus was my brother and I had another brother, I wouldn't go around telling people I'm the brother of Bob. I'd be like, yeah. I'm Jesus' brother. Yeah. So, so uh, there might be something to why does he, that's what you why does he introduce James as his brother? Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and there's and some... Jesus potential reasons why you might do that. So that's important to understanding or, or at least narrowing in some things about wh who he is and what he's trying to do here. Okay, what else? Mark 6.3? Yes. Yeah. That's why I knew you were going to say that. And sisters. But it reflects. Sister. So Mark 6.3 says what? Um, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joes and Judas mm -hmm. and Simon? 
Yeah. So it's it's the it's the parallel, basically. You have another another text that has that family mentioned. Anything else? Yes, sir. Are we still stuck on family or can we go on to the next? Well, we're on, do you have a specific biblical reference to? Well, I was going to down to the reference to Genesis later on. Here. Okay, we're not there yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. well, did, did anybody get um, John 7, 5? Mm -hmm. Let's look at that. I think it'll make... Uh, This in. So in John 7, <coughs> for not even his brothers believed in him. He's going up to the feast, and it tells us here, so we see that he's got this family, he's got brothers and sisters. And I'm not going to argue with you about the, you know, some people claim he didn't, that's what it says. That word for brothers could be used of other close family members, but it seems pretty clear that they're they're the sons of Mary. And so, um, but then we find out in John seven, during Christ's ministry, at least up to this point in Christ's ministry, what the brothers were what unbelievers. So, so John seven five, the brothers, therefore. Jude was an unbeliever during the ministry. It's like one of those V8 moments. How could it be so long? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I guess that explains what he was saying, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, I didn't say it. The Theologian said it. Well, it's there in the That's his humility, and he didn't want to identify himself. So his brothers didn't believe him. He was worthy. That's crazy. Any other? That's just crazy. There, there's at least one other one that I think it is pretty, pretty important. Anybody? In Acts chapter one, verse fourteen, we see something interesting. Doesn't specifically mention Jude, so we don't know if he's in there. But these brothers are mentioned several times. Then mm -hmm. after Judas uh, kills himself, we get this this passage here where Matthias is chosen to replace Judas, and it says, "All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers." Mm -hmm. So. We know during Jesus' ministry, his brothers are not with him, but later we see him at least with the apostles and with, with Mary and, and, and while they are praying. So you, you start to see this sort of progression. So, you know, Acts uh, 1, 14, the brothers are present with the church. Now, we don't know. It doesn't say they're... You know that they were fully converted or anything, but they're they're there with the church. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Richard. Well, I felt, I felt completely dismembered at this point because I'm not. I, I I didn't. I guess my my understanding. I I, I was focused on looking at. at, at Introduction of who the person was, rather than looking at cross references, which would have been very edifying. But I, I didn't think of doing that for the purpose of which I should have. So, but anyway, I was going to mention Genesis here as one of them. Well, that's a reference that he is that a reference to who the author is, or is that a reference? Well, it's not to his reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. You're still going yeah. to reference to who the author is. Okay. Yeah, we're we we'll, I thought you were doing it. No, we'll we'll connect with that when we get to that part of the 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 book. We'll go look up those references. Um, okay. So th there's a lot of information, but it's not, you, you get all these little pieces of the puzzle and you start to, to see that this, this person is likely somebody who, while Jesus was there performing his ministry, wasn't a believer in him, 
later he begins, you, we start to see him where the church is, and then you start to see, um, you start to see some things develop later. Obviously, he's a believer by this time that this letter is written and all the things that we said earlier. He seems to have some kind of authority. He seems to be somebody who's at least well-respected. He has this kind of relationship with them. Um, probably the most critical piece of information, though, as we are going to interpret the letter is then, if that's all the case, why does he introduce himself as a brother of James? Because he's a half-brother. He's not a full brother. He may be a half brother. How do, where do you get that from? Because Jesus is from God. Oh yes. Yeah, so, well, that's you mean in that sense. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, that could be. Um, well, then now we have to kind of ask some questions about. Well, who is James? <laughs> do you see how this how this works? And I'm not going to make this. A lot of Judas and a lot of James. It gets. Yeah, I'm not going to make you go confusing. go do all that. But there are several. <laughs> We see the same thing, and we see references in Matthew. If you want to write these down and look them up later, you can. Matthew 27, 56, Mark 15, 40, Luke 24, 10. We see James is a, uh, an important oh, lesson. Luke 24, 10. There are lots of references to James, and again, there are more than one person named James. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, or, uh, it says, uh, Then he, being Jesus, appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So James is specifically mentioned as somebody that Christ revealed himself to after the resurrection, and the apostles. Um, probably an important one if we look at Galatians 2, 9. Uh, I'll start at 7. This is Paul writing to the church at Galatia, uh, talking about his his authority. But he says, On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, <coughs> you who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. He's talking about the apostles, the leaders in the church. And when James and Cephas and John who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me. They gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles. That's hugely important because who are, men, who are, who are mentioned as the leaders of the church here? James, Cephas. Cephas, who's who? Peter. Peter and John. So when we tend to think of the apostles, like there's that group of three that are really the the ones that are ever involved in everything, you know, you've got Peter and, and John and, and James. This can't be, this is uh, not James the son of Alphaeus, I don't think. This is good because this happens later. So we think this is Judas's brother, Jesus's brother, who's the head of the church in Jerusalem. And so in Acts 15, you have the council, which is what Paul's referring back to here. Because the other James was, was killed very early on. So in Acts 15, 13, after they finish speaking, you've got this council. And then this is a very difficult issue. Should the converts have to become Jewish? Should they be circumcised? Should they have to follow the law in every respect? There's this big debate. And how does the debate end, end basically, is that this James stands up and speaks... And in, in verse 13, he says, after they, or verse 13, after they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. This James stands up and starts to say, look, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. And, and once he's done speaking, it's it's ended. So the fact that he's the last person to speak, he speaks seemingly, seemingly with the most authority here. So we know that James, and you, there, there are a lot of other references that you could go through to, to learn about James. But what's interesting is that Jude mentions that he's the brother of James, who is, uh, 
the head of the church in Jerusalem. So he is looked at as a, as a, as a pillar of the church. And so what does that tell us about Jude, right? He's, he's a brother of Jesus or half-brother of Jesus. He's a brother of James. He doesn't introduce himself as an apostle, introduce himself as a bond servant and the brother of James. Does that give us, I mean, what might that tell us? What, what are some things we might want to take note of? Go I just ahead. want to clarify, you mentioned in passing. So the James, who is one of the 12 apostles, he's the one that died early on. Yeah, this so James. killed as an example. Yeah, this James, this James, we believe, is the one who's later, who's killed later. They're both, they both end up yeah. dead. So why is not this James you're talking about James, one of the twelve original? Well, apostles. because remember his brothers were not believing in him. Right. So the other James is the brother of John. Right. James and John. Southern That's Southern not Mary the brother of Mary. So right. So it's a different James. We're, we've got two different yeah. groups of right. people. Right. But all these references you're giving to a James, because if if James and Peter and John were together. Why wouldn't that be the James brother? Of yeah, John? yeah, and there's debates about yeah. that. I'm coming down. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that this is the James who is the because this is much later, right? This is after Paul's ministry started. The other James is dead, I believe. So okay, so that's yeah, that makes sense. Right, and so yeah, you can dig into this some more. There are some arguments both ways. There are some yeah. people who argue they're the same person, but it. I really, I really don't think so. I, what I'm giving you is the summary that that's the general conservative okay. scholarship on the on it. So this can all get you know you can you can get into all of these things pretty pretty uh, intricately. But for our purpose here, right. we know that he's referencing James, who is this is written later. So we know that this is by this time this is certainly not. I wouldn't say it was. Original Apostle James, who would have been no, because he's not, he's not, he's not the brother. he doesn't have a brother named Jude, right? Okay, he's likely a younger brother, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's possible he's a I younger know. brother, yeah. Like Jack said, we'll let the scholars argue that, argue that one. So, I would say sorry. he's probably humble, like Richard said earlier. Yeah, you guys mentioned this fact of humility. So, yeah. yeah. So theologians it, believe that, and that's why theologians are. I believe it. Though. I think that that's that possibly plays a part in it. Again, we don't know for sure. There's yeah. some other things that might be going on there, though, as well. Why might if I was writing a letter to you, um, why might I mention my relationship with Josh? Part What's of that authority. That could be authority. Sort of, could be kind of like a respect thing, but not sort of. Yeah. Yeah. So, so these people, at the very least, these people know James. Right. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't mention that, right? Right. And so, um, association. There's an association here with James that's important to him. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't know. We're speculating here, but. This is important to him because he mentions it. Mm -hmm. He wants these people to to know he's he's Jude, the brother of James. Maybe there's another Jude known to them, right? Maybe there's more than one Jude. Hey, I'm, this is this letter's from Jude, the brother of James. Mm -hmm. So there, the, whatever this is, he's connecting himself to this well-known figure of of James. He doesn't he doesn't claim any apostolic authority mm -hmm. here. He doesn't introduce him as an apostle, himself as an apostle. He doesn't introduce himself even as the brother of Christ as though he has some sort of individual authority on the basis of that relationship. In fact, what does he introduce himself as a bond, bond servant, servant, which is the, the same way that any Christian would think of their relationship. Also, um, he, he talks about their common salvation so what's interesting is here you have somebody writing a pastoral letter, an authoritative letter, and yet not introducing themselves with this sort of uh, position in the church type authority. Did you notice that? Did you pick up on that the first time you read? Sounds 
like humility to me. Could be humility. It could be that he is a well-respected elder in the church, and yet not he, he may not have an office in the mm-hmm. church. He's not writing this in in the sense of uh, the way Paul sometimes writes. Like, look, I'm asking you. I could tell you, right. but I'm asking you. That's right. I'm being nice. <laughs> he's not he's not approaching this that way, and so. I think that reinforces this this sort of affectionate relationship as well, because he's as we'll see he uses this term beloved several times. There's a there's a it's it's not a hierarchical thing. Like I'm telling you what to do. It's it's an urgency it seems that's born out of this this connection that he has with him more than some authoritative relationship. He he, he doesn't even mention that he's Christ's brother. He's not approaching it on that basis. Could be humility playing into that, could be several things that are going into it, but for whatever reason, um, he's... Maybe... Go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, I don't know, but maybe he's using the connection with James because maybe James was saying the same message to people. Could be. You know, contend for the faith. The Jews are coming in. Could be. We don't know for sure. He's saying, I'm saying the same thing James is saying. But, so Jesus is obviously in, in heaven, in glory at the time this is written. I'm assuming James is active. <laughs> James is probably in charge of something. He's known to these people, or he's at least respected by these people. Um, and he's coming at it in a way to distinguish himself, that he's this particular Jude associated with this James, but he's not invoking apostolic authority. And I, I think if I'm right about which... Which right. Jude this is? It's because he's, I mean, he's not an apostle. Yeah. Remember when um, the disciples told Jesus, "Your mother and your brothers are out there wanting to talk to you." Yeah. And he said, "Who are my mothers? My mother and my brothers. Those that hear the word of God and do it." Right. It's kind of neat that Jude didn't claim that as his authority. For one thing, I'm sure he had in his heart. It took him a long time to come to that. That would be humbling. Yeah. But also, Jesus himself said, who are my mothers and brothers? So he wasn't coming with that as his authority. I think that's a great point. But right. as a Implicit bond servant of Christ, with that association with James, now I'm going to tell you, look out for these guys. No, I, I, think, that's a, I think that's right. Because all of the people who are claiming that title apostle spent time with Jesus in his ministry being instructed. Yeah. And even Paul, although Christ was, to, Christ spent time with Paul, remember he goes off and he's with him for quite some time. And so, um, and even Paul refers to himself as one born untimely. untimely. And so, <clears throat> well, I think that this idea of humility is important. This is where the theologians get this connection yeah. because he's, he was not working with Christ and the apostles to advance the kingdom while he was here. Yeah. It's not until later, the first the first place we see his brothers associated with the churches in Acts after you know and that's after Christ is crucified. And then later we see we start to see glimpses of them doing things. But um, I would imagine that uh, to to take that title upon himself um, it is really it would be inappropriate because he wasn't an apostle. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's that's a, that's a great insight. Anything else? I want to say, sort of, as we wrap this up, that if you were doing this on your own, you might not you might not get everything. And, and some of these things, we're not even sure. They're just sort of observations, and that's okay. You know, the important thing. The important thing is to just be getting as much as you can. Just take, take the time to ask, well, who is this person? And the more you do this, the more these kind of details will start to pop out at you, and you'll start to kind of see that stuff. But even little things like you mentioned, he's literate. Well, that's important. He wrote a letter, right? Yeah. So, there, the, you know, all of this starts to, to, you put all these pieces together, you start to get a little bit more of a feel for who this person is. And then you start with the book that you're in. And it's really important that you, you, you stay with that because that's what you know for sure. That's what he told you for sure. 
then you go, well, who is this person in terms of what else we see in the scripture? Okay, now you start to see some pieces filled in. And in some cases, there will, there will be people who um, are historical figures that are well known. And you might be able to find out more about, uh, you know, just from history. But in the case of someone like Jude, or really in the case of anybody, what's most important to interpreting the passage that you're looking at or the book you're looking at is what they shared about themselves in that book because that's what he wanted these people reading this to know mm -hmm. and in this case um, in this case he's he's not establishing some sort of, of uh, authority based upon his office he's establishing his authority or his right to address them on the basis of his relationship and so that's that's a fine distinction, but it becomes important as we read through what he has to say um, because it goes to maybe why he's writing. What is his purpose, right? Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, any last questions? Yeah, what's next week's assignment? So we're not going to spend as much time on this piece of it next week in class, but I want you to do the same thing in terms of who he's writing to and there's a lot there's less information there but I just want you to take some time to go through that we're not going to spend the whole class period on it we're going to we're going to move on but in order for you to kind of complete the steps I want you to kind of do the same thing go through this letter and get as much information about who these people are as you can and what their relationship to each other is and all of those all of that okay, okay thank you all right